Hello, everyone. Good afternoon. Welcome back to many of you. This is number 18 in our Digital Trader Summit webinar series. Uh, I'm very happy to be back. We started off the year with a very special topic. We were talking about mental health last week, and I was really happy to see how much uh, yeah, of uh, participants we had and how engaged the discussion developed. Uh, but today, it's time to go back to the markets, and uh, it's time to go back to, to carbon. Um, we talked last time about it with Lawson Steele uh, in last May, and uh, it was a really incredible discussion. Prices were around 15 euros, if I remember it right. So I'm uh, super happy to have him back. He's a real authority in the market, and uh, I've seen the charts. Uh, we talk about 110, that will be an awesome webinar again. Uh, as I'm not the expert, I'm counting again of all of your participation. Please uh, contribute with your questions and your comments. Uh, use the Q&A function on the bottom or the chat, and I will pick up a question uh, after the short presentation uh, to have a real lively discussion with all of you. It's time to hand over to you, Lawson. Thanks for being again on this webinar, and the uh, show is yours. Yeah, good afternoon, and uh, good day to anybody in uh, other time zones. Uh, thanks, Jens. Thanks for having me. Thanks to Anmark for uh, uh, inviting me back again. Uh, it's a real privilege. Um, so, <clears throat> yeah, I guess the you know, I'll, I'll kick off with the, uh, uh, the presentation I put together where uh, the whole point is to try and explain why I have this ludicrous uh, uh, target of 110 or seemingly ludicrous, uh, which we think can uh, can happen by, you know, the end of this, uh, this year. Um, I haven't got my uh, PowerPoint here, but that seems to work quite well. Okay, so here we are. So, um, <clears throat> You know what I what I what I know damn well is that I'm going to be wrong. Uh, I, it's not going to be 110, um, and it may not be Q4. Uh, it could be higher, it could be lower, it could be earlier, it could be later. Uh, what I think then will happen is that after a few quarters of uh, a a high price, uh, there will be a political reaction, uh, and uh, and then. Uh, it will take time um, because you have to sort of put it through the uh, various machinations of the EU. Uh, but <clears throat> but and then there'll be some kind of political response which will bring the carbon price uh, down. But it may not come down as far as I'm I'm forecasting there. Um, just as a reminder, you know, I, I kicked off our bullish stance in January 2018 uh, when the, the permits were at six euros. Uh, so we're up. You know what five six times that uh so <clears throat> i'm only talking about a a tripling this time not not six times uh, from where we are um <clears throat> look to um what's going to happen here is that the the carbon price has to get to a price at which uh you you trigger the intensity of the political debate uh, and at that point it needs to be there for a period of time, so that one quarter, two quarters, that kind of thing, uh, to realize it's not a one-off. Um, uh, and then the debate starts, and then what happens is that uh, the Commission puts a proposal towards the, the European Council. 75% uh, of the 27 members have to agree. They then pass that on to uh to via the commission to parliament 75 percent of parliament's 27 members need to agree uh, uh and if they want to make amendments it goes back to council and so on so what i'm getting at is it becomes a protracted political process uh and then after that do you, does it get enacted in law uh so so it could what i'm saying is that this this 110 for three quarters could be extended uh it could be way north of that uh, maybe it takes a little bit more time to kick in, or maybe it starts a little bit earlier. Uh, obviously, the steeper the the price, uh, the the faster, uh, uh, perhaps more intense political reaction. Um, but that's yeah, that, that's kind of roughly the shape uh, I'm thinking of. So I, 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 I'm I'm more than happy with the the magnitude, the direction, and the shape of this curve. Uh, but obviously, it's a commodity, and and you know things move. Um, I'll come back to this at the end, but I want to just go through um, a couple of things. Um, that's there if anybody wants to be familiar with the ETS, but we kind of did uh, some of that last time, but I'll touch on a couple of points as we go through. Um, so this is uh, how we look at uh, the, the, the deficit now. 
if you if you remember by some sheer chance, certainly far better memory than mine, um, this you know back in in March or May, I guess when we did this, uh, I had assumed that this year, this, that sorry, 2020, uh, that we would have a 20% contraction in in industrial output. Why? Because I decided to kitchen sink everything um, and make sure that the the carbon story withstood a a very severe. Uh, economic reaction. Of course, there was a very severe economic reaction, but it was about half as bad as we'd as we'd predicted, with the industrial output falling nine percent, not twenty. So these numbers uh, now assume that we get a recovery this year from the nine point one percent fall last year to nine percent recovery this year, uh, and then a further four percent next year, and then further out from twenty twenty three onwards, I assume zero point five percent increase in industrial production. ACA uh, emissions. Um, <clears throat> so what does it mean? I mean, the top chart tells you in the absolute numbers, um, the bottom chart tells you in percentage terms. So, so it's basically saying, look, this year, there's going to be a 27% shortage uh, in demand uh, or, or in, in permits to meet demand. Uh, next year's 36%, uh, the year after 32%. So all in all, by 2024, we're talking about 112% uh, cumulative uh, shortfall. Um, now remember, uh, it, and it's really important to, to think about the pricing here, uh, is that you know, this year, when uh, emitters can only find 63 of the 100 permits, uh, or 100 emissions they, they emitted, um, and they're still short of 27 permits, uh, and which and on April the 30th, of course, they have to go to their governments and say, right, I've emitted 100, here are my 100 permits. If they don't have those 27, uh, on those 27, uh, they get fined, 110 euros, hence the 110 in the price forecast. Um, but it's, of course, it's worse than that because they still have to make good on those 27 million permits they don't deliver this year, next year. So next year, in 2022, there's a 36% shortage um, so it, it, you're trying to find 36 permits you, you cannot deliver, but it's worse than that because you're trying to find the 27 from the previous year as well. So actually you are on a cumulative basis for those two years alone, 63% short. Uh, and that's why uh, you get to, you know, the, the carbon press can go way north uh, of 110. Um, so that's that's one picture, um, and and it's kind of a, a, a effectively a refresh of what we uh, presented back in May. Um, <clears throat> excuse me, but there is another uh, way of looking at this, uh, which is a kind of a soft pushback. I get sometimes saying, "Well, hang on a minute, Lawson. You know, there's all these permits out there um, which uh, have not been surrendered yet." Uh, <clears throat> excuse me. Hang on. <coughs> Spell it. I'm um, sorry, I've just been in the gym, so I'm a bit dry. Um, so um, th th another way of, of saying, as I said, is that you, know, you look at all these permits that are out there and they say, well, can't they be utilized to, to you know, effectively cover that 200 million deficit and so on? So that's what this table is here. Now, this, I hate putting up busy slides. Um, so I'm just going to focus on, <clears throat> on one year uh, to, to talk through the numbers. So, so this says, look, there are 1,293 million permits out there. So these are permits which have been issued in the past but have not been surrendered. Uh, it's called the, the TEEN Act, the total number of allowances in circulation. Um, <clears throat> of that, uh, you know, I calculate that utilities are hedging about 850 million. So, so those uh, are utilized effectively, uh, which leaves a balance of 440 million, 442. Uh, that 442 is owned by non-utilities, obviously, uh, which is a mixture primarily of industrials, but also some financial investors. So, so that's the, 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 the balance sheet picture, if you like, of what's out there. So, of course, that means that with the 442, you can actually cover the 200 million deficit of this year. Right. So that would leave you with a balance still in your pocket, say, of 242 million permits. That looks fine. But it ignores the fact that some industrials will also want to hedge. Uh, uh, and I calculate that to be around the 140 million, 137 million level, uh, which leaves you with a balance of 106. Still positive, still good. Uh, so you could utilize all those permits to cover your position, still have some left in your pocket. However, 
Uh, that means that if financial investors own 107 million permits, then the then that creates the the immediate deficit. There are just no more permits to go around in that situation. And I think uh, what's going to happen is that we go from uh, you know a 40 or 50 million holding at the end in, in 2020, uh, and I think we're going to ramp up pretty quickly. Or financial investors are going to ramp up more to the point. Uh, to levels which we've you know we saw two years ago, three years ago, uh, and potentially more, um, and that will happen because a they realised that actually they could push uh, the system into deficit this year, uh, uh, or and or b uh, they see what's coming, and what's coming of course is that next year, you know because you've been covering two years worth of deficits uh, with with the permits in your pockets, you're left with a precariously small long position. Uh, which evaporates the moment you have industrial hedging uh, and, and accentuates even further, of course, with financial investors. So the picture is essentially saying, look, 2022, there are just not enough permits in your pocket. Uh, 2021, you might get away with it, depending on what financial investors do. Uh, but I would suspect the financial investors will start anticipating. So it's just another way of, of looking at it. You know, whichever way you skin this cat, you either got this, this deficit here, uh, which you can see, for, which is a, a decade-long deficit, even though there's a recovery from 2025, uh, decade-long cumulative deficit. Uh, uh, and in any case, even though there are permits out there, they are pretty much uh, utilized. You might be able to sort of you know, assuage one year, but not, not more than that. Um, <clears throat> so that's the, 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 the picture there. <clears throat> then I'm going to talk about some sensitivities, and then we'll come back to the pricing in a minute. Um, so sensitivity is so. So I said that we got industrial production growing uh, at at nine uh, percent and four percent next year. Um, if we did an acid test and say, you know what, okay, that's not going to happen. Uh, there's going to be zero economic growth this year and next year, and only 0.5 percent thereafter. Which, by the way, is a pretty conservative number given that the historical average is 1.7 percent growth per annum, not 0.5. Um, then you would see obviously that from our base case on the left to to uh, to this asset test on the right, yeah, you know, the deficit is less, um, but it's still pretty significant. Yeah, you know, nineteen percent uh, shortage instead of a twenty-seven percent uh, for this year, twenty-eight instead of thirty-six percent next year. Um, but these are still big numbers. You know, so cumulatively, yeah, cumulatively by uh, twenty twenty-four, we're at a, an eighty-one percent. Uh, shortfall instead of 112. It's it's better, but it's still big, and you're still in a, dec a deficit for the whole uh, decade. So ultimately, this means that um, even even under an acid test, uh, the carbon market is is tight. Now <clears throat> there there are as we as we well know um, now there's there's all this uh, green deal and what's happening with that um, and the impact that might have uh, on the ETS system. Uh, and this next two slides kind of deal with that. Um, so obviously, we know, you know, we now got this target of 55% uh, by a reduction in 1990 levels by, by uh, 2030. Um, the ETS, the carbon scheme, will take a share of that. Um, you know, the, the, uh, the emissions which fall under the auspices or umbrella of the ETS system is 41% is of European emissions. Um, um, uh, and the ETS system is up and running and it works, um, finally. Uh, uh, and consequently, you know, what I think is going to happen here is that the, the, the yeah, well, either the, uh, the EU decides that the ETS system will continue to take its share, the same share uh, of, uh, of emission cuts, say so going from 40% to 55%. Um, uh, or it might say, you know what, we might tighten it. But there are a lot of things they can do. But the, the interesting thing for me, and, and I sensitize different things here, you know, you've got the, the, the I, what I assume in my base case is that the ETS share continues at 41% <clears throat> and that you have a, the linear reduction factor uh, kicking in in 2026. The LRF the linear reduction factor is the, the annual reduction in the emissions cap. Of course, that cap or set back in 2008 to climb by roughly 2% per annum. Um, now, of course, because we have a tighter uh, uh, green goal by 2030, <clears throat> you need that to accelerate. 
uh, and come down by more than 2% per annum. So I'm assuming that kicks in in 2026. But you could bring that forward. Uh, it could kick in in 2024. Um, so the same absolute reduction, but spread over more years, but starting earlier. Uh, they might say, you know what, let's let's just front load that. Let's take 100 million out first and have a smaller linear reduction factor subsequently, which is what this chart is, uh, or do all that and make sure that the ETS has an even bigger share uh, to, to, to or bigger emission cut than, uh, than its 41% share would suggest. Uh, it's kind of slightly counterintuitive to this, but essentially it says that by 2030, the ETS share should be 36%, not 41, which implies more, more emission cuts. So what you can see is that under each scenario, it looks worse than, than, uh, than what I'm using as the base case. Um, and under each scenario, it shows a decade of deficits. And also under each scenario, the first three years don't change. And that's quite interesting because everything they're talking about is, is from 2024 onwards. Okay. And the, everything they're talking about is either neutral, you know, do we keep things as is or do we tighten them? Uh, and it seems to be leaning towards tightening. And the other way, uh, the other thing they can play around with is the, is the MSR. Um, so the MSR, if you remember, is the, the mechanism by which they create the deficit. So that MSR kicks in uh, if there are more than 833 million unutilized permits out there, i.e. the total number of allowances in circulation. Um, uh, and as you saw in that previous uh, table, there's you know, 1,293 million opening balances here. Um, it's, it's about 200 million more because it, it would exclude aviation, but that's a technical thing in case anybody is, is wondering. Um, the MSR uh, kicks in, it says, right, I'm going to take 24% of that number away from the annual auction level, as long as that number is greater than 833. That 24% uh, drops to 12% in 2024 as things stand. So the base case we have is that, you know, the MSR drops to 12% in 2024 and that the 833 million threshold, you know, stays in place. What could happen is that they might keep the MSR at 24%, in which case it doesn't actually make an awful lot of difference because really what you have to do is to, is to because by this stage, basically the total number of permits out there in the system uh, are around that threshold of 833 or below. So if it's, if it's below that, then the MSR just doesn't do anything. Um, so if you reduce the threshold, say to 600 million, then you can see then that does impact things. Um, or they might go for a hybrid saying, you know what, well, we won't do 24, but we won't do 12 or do 18, you know, whatever. Um, but again, whichever one of these you look at, you're in a deficit in each you know, for the for the rest of the decade and again the these three first years do not change uh, so and, and and the final again <laughs> is that uh, you know what they are saying is do we keep it as it is or do we tighten it uh, so so everything pointing to me is pointing to to you know it's already a deficit the price is going to go up come what may it could be even tighter so that's so. So coming back to this slide, um, you know, th this is why I've got this. You know, this this could go way north. Uh, this whole picture uh, from 2024 could be different. It's, we, you know, we 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 might see that a, a further tightening. Um, but what is certain is that you know demand and supply are not intersecting, uh, and consequently, uh, the way I th I think about the price formation here. Is is about what is politically acceptable, because you know f further out. I'll come back to that that political acceptability in a second. But further out, um, you know, there will be carbon abatement by industry, but that's going to take time, right? Uh, you know, I think I mentioned it back in May, but you know, the the reality is that if you are a company. Uh, uh, you, know, you just imagine the scene, the CEO calls everybody, all the engineers and said, right, guys, you've done a fantastic job. We have a state of the art process. Uh, we are world beaters. It's amazing. Uh, but you need to reduce carbon uh, emissions by another 30, 40 percent. Well, you can imagine the shock and, and sort of uh, awe which that creates. And, and you, know, you have engineers jaws on the floor. Uh, then they'll go away. They'll come up with some half baked ideas. Uh, eventually three or four will seem reasonable. They'll do test pilots on those. 
uh, they'll realize that actually two of them can't they can't really scale up uh, the other two might work uh, eventually they're honing on one uh, they, they refine it a bit more uh, and then eventually they they sort of do you know run it, roll it out piecemeal it needs tweaking after the first one you, you know this is a multi-year process you know a, a you know, two-year three-year four-year process assuming they've got the balance sheet to do that but it requires the carbon price to go up to the level at which the that industry will think about abating um uh so for example heidelberger cement which is this point number three here uh the cfo there said that he thinks you need 120 in the cement industry to do that um so it needs to get up to whatever that price is for that industry to think about it it needs to stay there for again one or two quarters to understand that this is a a a, a permanent shift uh, and then the whole process starts so so i don't see demand and supply intersecting here and therefore as i said i'll come back to it what drives this price here will be political acceptability uh, and we, when we think about political acceptability, you know, in, in 2018, in January, when I, I put out the buy case and said it's going to go to 65 uh, for this year, uh, I got, uh, uh, you know, a lot of laughter. Uh, some people see it saying, don't be so ridiculous. It won't even get to 50, Lawson. Uh, well, we've already paid 50 euros in the UK, right? Uh, because the UK, although we're now, we've now exited uh, the, the ETS scheme, uh, but until last year, you know, we, we were paying the ETS price plus 18 pounds. So when it got to, you know, 30 euros or so, effectively, I was paying 50 euros, not a murmur in the press, nothing, absolutely nothing. Uh, so clearly 50 plus is acceptable in the UK. In Germany, you know, the, they now have a German carbon tax, which began this year at 25 euros per tonne. It's, it's completely separate to the carbon scheme. Uh, it's for industries outside it. But nevertheless, uh, that 25 pounds escalates to 65, uh, 25 euros escalates to, uh, to uh, 65 by 2026. Uh, so clearly in the industrial heartland of Europe, um, where Germany had stands the most to lose in theory, uh, it is saying that 65 euros is acceptable. Um, then you've got some other things. You've got kind of Bank of England saying beware of 120 or, or, or prepare for 120. Uh, Norway says they want 200 euros by 2030, uh, yeah, and so on. Um, so, you know, we'll, we'll have to see. I, 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 as I said, this could go way north. I mean, theory, carbon goes to infinity in a deficit. Um, but obviously, political reaction will stop that. So, as I said, you know, I'm, uh, I'll get the 110 wrong. Uh, I can take that. I'm, I'm old enough. <laughs> um, yeah, it may not be Q4, uh, but the shape and direction and magnitude I'm happy with, and there will be some kind of reaction. But it could be that, that as I said, that doesn't push it down to 50. They, they might say, you know what, 75 is appropriate or, or, or whatever. How they actually achieve that, we'll have to see. But, but I'm saying that there will be a reaction. So um, I think that's it, isn't it? Yeah. So I'll take I'll I'll take uh, questions if there are any. Yeah, there are. Sure, there are. Thanks, Lars. That was great. Um, making stepping in, there were two questions. A little bit. You were talking about openly about the sixty-five. You were forecasting, and now the hundred and ten. If you break it down, what were the main changes now? What has happened in the in the last six months from your perspective to which leads to this adoption? Well, I'm, I'm, uh, I mean, I'm still forecasting 65 for the year as an average, so that hasn't changed. It's just the, the shape of it. Mm -hmm. um, but, uh, you know, the, the 65 is, 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 the only, is the only number in the market, so I'm, I'm really curious to know where the German uh, 65 euro uh, came from. <laughs> I, mean, I may not find that, uh, the answer to that. But... Um, uh, the 65 came back in January 2018 when I looked at uh, the the switching level from lignite to gas, and that required at the time a 65 euro carbon price. The reality with lignite is that it's a red herring because uh, lignite cannot close immediately. I mean, obviously you've got your your phased close uh, closings in in Germany, um, but you know, given that you've got the nuclear uh, closures in 2022 uh, in Germany. Um, uh, you, you cannot close the lignite because you a you run out of capacity. You, you, the lights will go off, basically. 
uh, and secondly you got all sorts of social issues and everything else so uh, I don't see that happening so for me that is it's, it's yeah at the time it's we I was trying to find a price I could justify uh, and, and but the reality is time times moved on and that's, that's just there's nothing which suggests 65 there's no math behind that which is why I'm curious into for the German uh, target <laughs> No, great. Um, and I think you, you tied it as well to a discussion about uh, political acceptance. Um, that is a big topic, obviously. You s you're citing here as well Norway, England, and uh, Germany as, 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 let's say, where you have responses or expectations from the market. There was one question from our one participant specifically about the Eastern European countries. I mean, you're in the EU. It's a joint decision-making process. What is your view on, on political acceptance in the yeah, or Eastern part, Middle Europe. Well, look, I mean, there's, there's uh, the first thing is there's two, there's two sides to this coin. Uh, and it's all very well to see bang on about, and, and, and rightly so, I'm not knocking it, but bang on about, uh, uh, oh, this is going to harm our industry or whatever. Uh, but the other side is saying, well, at the same time, the EU is selling on everybody's behalf 600 million permits or so each year. Uh, at a price, say, of 30 euros, that's you know, uh, 18 billion euros, which is, gets collected by the EU and distributed to the 27 finance ministries. Uh, and the Eastern European countries are included in that. So their, their finance ministries love this. Uh, and of course, just to put that into context, you know, when the price goes to 60, that's going to be 36 billion euros, which is as, as near enough as damn it as the, the UK Brexit bill, except that the carbon revenues will be an annual uh, stream not a one-off uh, so so these are big numbers uh, particularly so when uh, governments are uh, feeling the covid pain and and having to try and raise finances elsewhere uh, so so that's one half of the thing but the but to come back to the, the sort of perhaps the the more important point um look if you go back to the end of phase two which ended in 2012 so carbons had we're in phase four now, but phase two ran, phase two ran from 2008 to 2012. And in that period, um, utilities were getting 90, 95% free allowances along with everybody else. Uh, but from 2013, they got zero. I mean, just boom, gone. Um, and therefore they had to go and buy in the market and hedge and everything else. The exception were, were the Eastern European utilities. Right, so Poland, Hungary, Czech, and all those guys, you know, made a lot of noise and said, yeah, we're, we're heavily, heavily, heavily coal dependent. We can't possibly change that quickly and so on. Uh, and, and in fact, it got to a stage where they, they had to change the, the EU had to change the approval process because every time they wanted something and they needed a unanimous majority, Poland would stick up his hand and say no, or Hungary would or Czech or whatever. So that's why they changed it to the qualified majority of 75%. Uh, but anyway, so, so today, um industry as well uh until last year certainly were were getting 90 percent of the allocations for free uh going forward from this year the allocation is going to drop uh to to about 75 percent uh so that means that uh industries are uh and and whether well, and eastern european utilities are going to have to uh purchase 25 percent of their emissions not 10 percent and at a higher carbon price which is kind of interesting because, you know, at some point, if you think about that from an, an industrial point of view, you know, it means that until uh, this year, they've had to buy 10% of the carbon price. That's been their carbon cost. So in other words, their carbon, the net, you know, 10% of 30, you know, three euros is what carbon has been costing them, which is peanuts, which is why you've had no industrial abatement. So from this year, it's going to be 25% times that price. But it's still, you know, what's that, seven, eight euros on today's price? It's not that high. But at some, but, but nevertheless, it becomes more, you know, over time, that cost becomes more and more and more. And at some point for different industries, all of a sudden you become, uh, you, 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 it's going to trigger them to think, oh, hang on a minute, this carbon cost, what's that? Uh, why is it going up? Let's understand the market. They look at this and say, oh, okay, right. So what we need to do now is to hedge and abate. Uh, and that's going to be a snowball effect. And I, I think I think there's a snowball effect to come from industry for that reason. 
I think there's a snowball effect to come from utilities because all electricity costs are going to go up significantly. Our electricity cost forecasts are 80% above the forward curve for next year, um, as an example, and then about 50 to 60% thereafter. Um, uh, all electricity costs go up, therefore electricity customers will want a longer dated product. The utilities will oblige by buying and hedging their positions in the market, which means they're buying more carbon, which pushes the carbon price up, right? And then you've got a third element of the snowball, uh, which is financial investors who have two parts, I think. One is you know, the financial investors who are uh, seeing what's coming and uh, essentially accelerating the process. Um, uh, but then there's also, I think, funds, and I was having a discussion this morning with some, some colleagues. Uh, I think there are funds out there who, in their in their want to align themselves with the 2030 and 2050 goals, I align that align align the whole portfolio. Uh, so they're doing ESG and everything else. Um, one of the most obvious things to do align your portfolio is to buy carbon permits, which is rapidly becoming an asset uh, in its own right. Um, and I think that will come too. So I can see this whole snowball thing happening for different reasons. Did is, I ask the question? Is the acceptance of it all. I mean, is is doesn't your view the acceptance of a certain price level depend as well on the activities of financial players in the market? And secondly, as well, you, you talked about maybe the technological innovation taking some time, but you may have as well abatement by moving operations outside the EU. Are these two factors part of your scenarios? Um, uh, let me come back to the financial thing, and I, I'm going to ask you to reiterate that in, in different forms so I uh, comprehend it differently. Um, on, on the on the industrial, so um, yeah, the e, I, I, I'm not a great fan of the. I, I think the system is, is flawed fundamentally because you got one supplier, and the price either does that or that. Uh, typical cap and trade kind of thing. Having said that, uh, with the system they had, they've been very clever with all the for want of a much better word, sticking plasters they put on it to make it work. Um, <clears throat> maybe I should call it nuts and bolts, really. Um, so what, they, what they've done with the, with the big players who are uh, at, deemed at risk of what they call carbon leakage, which is exactly what you say, Jens, is, is, you know, I, can, I can take my factory in Bremen and shove it into Algeria, and I can produce the same widget uh, with the same carbon intensity, probably higher actually, because the Algerian laws are pretty low in carbon emissions, uh, if they have them. Uh, and therefore, from, from the planet's point of view, that's bad. Neutral or bad? So what's the point of just shooting ourselves in the foot? So the EU says, we will cover your carbon costs. So the acelon metals of this world have their carbon costs covered. So that prevents carbon leakage of that sort. The the second group of in industries are those which have a obviously a presence in the EU but cannot and, and have import competition but cannot for whatever reason financial or whatever uh, cannot up sticks and go to Algeria mm -hmm. so those guys are most at risk um, uh, and they don't get yeah you know, I mean they get the 90 percent carbon permits but they're not getting the hundred um, percent so so the so what they're talking about doing there is the carbon border adjustment mechanism right so a bit of a mouthful but it's a carbon border tax or or, or whatever mechanism it's going to be and what they're you know so we'll know more about this in june um the political impetus is to is to put this in place uh it's actually very difficult to do uh it potentially breaches article 20 of the wto um, but nevertheless, uh, there's a political impetus to do it, <clears throat> um, and potentially it's cement, which first uh, first first ha is the first industry industry to come in. So, what it will do is say, look, if you want to come and compete in Europe, love to have you here, uh, subject to the usual restrictions, uh, but also you need to be on the same carbon footing, and therefore we will either tax you, uh, or you have to buy. The, the right number of permits, whatever that mechanism is, that's kind of what they're deciding. Um, <clears throat> and then everybody's on the same footing. Now, if everybody's on the same footing, that's quite interesting because that means that 
you no longer need free allowances to be given to that industry. And therefore, the free allowances would be put into the something called the cross sector correction factor, which is a, a pot. Um, <clears throat> a pot there is, is, is just in case it's ever needed, but it won't be needed. Uh, and therefore, effectively, it's a reduction in supply. Um, so, so you're getting a reduction of supply, you're getting more buyers in the market through just the domestic cement players, potentially the international cement players too. Um, so that could be could be quite a positive. And what was your question on finance? I mean, the financial players are stepping in. They see basically the development of prices and see there's an opportunity right now. Uh, on the other side, politicians probably want to have control over the mechanism in a way. Yeah, uh, I mean, as you said, the financial players are speeding up the whole process of, of, of shortening in a way. Um, is that has, does that have an influence of the, on the political debate? Well, I, I, nobody, nobody will like the headlines of, you know, hedge fund makes massive killing on, on the EU ETS program, of course. Exactly. Um, but, um, but, you know, if you look at, if you look at financial players, they're, they're quite a marginal player in this. Okay. They're not, they're not dominating this. They, they can, they can push it over the edge. Um, but, but frankly, you know, yeah, back back in March, somebody said to me uh, when when COVID kicked off, I said, "Oh, well, that's the end of the carbon market, isn't it?" I said, "Why is that?" He said, "Well, you know, they won't tolerate a high carbon price uh, in these in these economic circumstances." I said, "Well, I see it differently. I see it that uh, for the first time in history, we've got all humans on the planet fighting under the same banner against an existen existential threat, COVID." And therefore, if you're worried about that, should you not be more worried about not having a planet? And therefore, will we not get even more sort of backing of that, which is kind of what's happened with the Green Deal and everything else. So, so I, I think that actually you need, there's no point waiting for the carbon price to reach the level at which you abate on the 31st of December 2030. That's too late. You know, it's all very well having a 2030 target, but actually you want to achieve that 80, 90 percent of that target now. Right. That's what we're trying to do here. So so actually, I think the the faster the carbon price goes up, um, the, the better, because that kicks everything into gear. That forces humans to come up with new ideas and for us to sort of work out how to how to deal with this at the moment it's, it's you know for the last 15 years as i said you know, indus in industry have done nothing yeah. nothing why because they're getting they're paying 10 percent of the carbon price they don't care yeah. so no so but yeah i mean obviously you don't want the, the, the headlines exactly yeah. we, we have plenty of questions here i'm trying to to pick a few they there were two questions around there are other scenarios as well in the market or analysts see not the same levels actually as you do? Uh, a little bit provocative from my, my side now. What, what do they get wrong or what do you see differently there? Uh, where is kind of an inconsistency in the market right now in the view? With what, with, with other analysts or? or, or yeah. what? Are there two, three things where they say this is what they get differently or they have a different opinion on? Yeah, I mean, the, 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 the big thing, I think, yeah. is that, you know, the, first of all, there are very few analysts, right? There's probably three, other four, yeah. three, three or four other analysts who have a, a proper uh, carbon model. Um, so, in other words, it's, uh, it's, it's quite a, it's still a cowboy market to, to, to a large extent. It's getting better. Uh, and actually, the fact the carbon price has gone up means that you've had a, a tussle. There, there's a tussle going on between the fundamental investors and the traders. The traders are looking at one day ahead, one quarter max, mm -hmm. maybe two kind of thing, but you know, kind of much more short termist. Uh, whereas the, the long guys are saying, well, hang on, you know, this is what's coming and we need to price that in. So there's a tussle developing, but the fact the price has, has gone up means we're moving towards, uh, towards the, you know, the, the, the long fundamentals. Uh, we're obviously not still there, but but we're getting there. Um, you know, I, I think the, the the reality is that um, you know we are the, these are, these other analysts are forecasting a deficit. They're not going to be the same deficit as mine, and everybody has slightly different deficits, but but they are forecasting a deficit. 
So that really does beg that question is why am I up here when they're down here? Uh, and, and I think it's, you know, what, what they're doing is they are saying, well, look, there's going to be industrial abatement. Um, and therefore, you know, that's going to attenuate things. Well, I think there's, there's two issues. One, for most industries, nobody has a clue what that industrial abatement price is because not even those industries know. Uh, and by the way, when they do abate, most of the abatement happens by uh, an intensification of electricity use, which of course generates carbon. So it's not quite the pure reduction in carbon emissions as, as perhaps they think, as one thinks. Um, uh, so that is a, so I think it's a mistake on a, a, a floating error on prices. And secondly, um, I think they, you know, they're making assumptions that that abatement either happens here or maybe happens in the outer years, but then they're using a DCF to work out what the implied average price should be over this period. So, you know, you end up with a, a, a straight line to somewhere around that 70 mark, shall we say, uh, with a few little oscillations, but, but broadly speaking, a straight line. Commodities don't do that. That doesn't happen. Uh, and, uh, you know, I, 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 as I said, that abatement doesn't happen for a while, a multi years. Um, and in the meantime, you've got this, you know, this, this, this deficit here. I mean, that's just absolutely huge. And as I proved with that point, you know, you're going to be using up that surplus of, of permits. Uh, so, so I think it's the price formation where we, we really, really differ. Yeah. Um, I try to summarize a handful of questions we got around different kind of players and their role in the market. So um, highlighting one would be industrials willing to borrow their allocations, their free allocations as well to others or to the market? What roles are the, the uh, utilities playing, financial players? Maybe even see retail kind of investors like we see now rushing to the, to the stock markets. Do you see there something changing in the role and the, as well the strategies different players have in the market? Will this trigger different kind of, you know? I think, I think the the thing which I think is really interesting at the moment is uh, a short term is the free allocation. Mm -hmm. So typically every February you get free allocation of permits, uh, and if you go back to two thousand eight when they kick, kicked off that phase, they gave you in February two thousand eight you got a bunch of free permits, mm -hmm. and then in February two thousand nine you got another bunch of free permits. And the, your first settlement date was April 30th, 2009 for 2008. But by that stage, you had two lots of free permits. So, so that means that you, as you know, a number of companies have sold that, you know, one lot because they only need one lot at a time. So they've got capital in, capital again and cash flow. That's created a, a problem uh, because as you get uh, towards your settlement on April 30th this year uh, for 2020, um you're you're not allowed to utilize phase three free allocations which is 2020 for phase four uh oh, sorry got it wrong around not like this phase four permits for settlement to phase three so in other words the february this year at free allocations you would get i'll come back to that uh, cannot be utilized to settle last year. So if you'd already sold your lot last year and didn't understand that, then you've got a problem. The, but but I, I think that's been reasonably well flagged and hopefully, I mean, there will always be some people who don't get it, but hopefully broadly they do. I think the major issue uh, is that the free allocations this year are not going to be given out potentially until May. Mm -hmm. So that's subsequent to the April 30th deadline. Uh, so that means that if if you thought, well, I'll get my permits in, in February and I can actually knock on somebody's door who's got phase three permits, swap them, pay them an extra euro, uh, and, and then I've got the permits I can need to settle, um, then you, you you won't be able to do that. So you will have to go to the market to buy. Uh, and that creates a further squeeze. And we're not talking small numbers. I mean, talk about you know, the free allocation is about 700 million permits. And that's huge. Right when it, when we're talking about two hundred million deficit for this year, so so I, I, that that to me is going to be quite an interest, interesting test of the market. Yeah. 
So do they become really part of the market's volumes in a way, or in a way they are separate huh? today? They are not contributing to the to the trading volume division. Yeah, I mean you could yeah that that could increase the trading volume, of course. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, we need to come to that point. Again, several questions here around what do you see as an effect on the power prices? Are you there as well, bullish uh, on this basis? Yeah, of course. I mean, you know, the the uh, half, you know, roughly half the cost uh, of the power price is the fuel cost, and the other half is carbon. So with carbon going up, um, obviously that feeds straight through, uh, and yeah. Maybe the gas price goes up 20, 30 percent or down 20, 30 percent. But with what's happening with carbon, that's going to dwarf that. Uh, so carbon is very much the driver. So, uh, you know, on average, I'm about uh, I think it's 55, 65 percent average of the next few years above the, the forward curve. Excellent. Look, we need to come to an end again. Uh, there are more questions. I have a little bit to apologize to the audience as well. I can't pick up everything. Some of them are quite technical, so we need to limit a little bit the time. But well, look, I mean, I've, I've, on the front of the presentation, you've got my LinkedIn. To, if you, I'm, I'm, I will respond if you get me on LinkedIn. <laughs> That's fantastic, exactly. Put it into the LinkedIn or as well on, on Office, uh, where we announced it on, on LinkedIn, this webinar. That could be as well a platform. Uh, we share definitely the, the, the questions with you as well. Uh, Lawson, so you have seen them. Um, overall, thanks again for a great discussion. Um, My pleasure. I hope, I hope, hope as well the audience. I'm really happy about that. Uh, bite right. you back. Let's see when the next time is. I, I look again on your price chart and see when is the right, right. time. To <laughs> I'll, I'll come back in tears. Yeah. <laughs> no, I don't I guess so. But building a kind of a history a track record. Uh, no, that's fantastic. Uh, thanks, everyone. I uh, hope to see you soon again. It's probably in two weeks' time. We haven't uh, invited already for the next session. Probably in two or three weeks', three weeks time, we'll be back. Um, happy to see all of you again tuning in. Thanks again. Have a good afternoon. Bye bye.